Hi, my name is Brad Mickley. Um, today we're going to talk about how to go from a chaos to control in your enterprise AI ML. I'm the CEO and founder of Jozu and uh, one of the maintainers of the KitOps open source project, which is of course one of the CNCF projects. Uh, Jozu is actually my second startup. Um, I've held positions at AWS, Red Hat, and CodeEnvy in the past. So let's jump in. Um, for most people on uh, watching this, you probably know how to deploy applications safely. You've got your code in Git, you've got your SHA digest, you've got versions, you've got environment configs uh, separated and tracked, deployment manifests are versioned, automated security scan, the whole nine yards. But AIML really breaks everything. Models are too big for Git. Even Git LFS is awkward and, and difficult. Uh, training data, you end up with something crazy. I'll get to that in a second. Often environment configs are not really tracked. They tend to be kind of embedded sometimes. Uh, you've got security scans that are not automated and not consistent. They may not even in fact be done at all. A lot of times people feel like, well, the base model was security scanned, so I'm gonna fine tune it. I don't need to do anything. It's not always that simple. And so I wanna start with the project catalog, which is definitely not the most exciting part of AIML, but it is in a lot of cases, the hub of the wheel, the most important thing that holds it all together. And for folks doing fine tuning, especially in security sensitive um, environments, you really need to have a private AIML project catalog because that's where you're gonna do your version control. You're gonna basically have at a point of logging or reporting for your security. You're gonna need policy-based pulls and deployments that connect to that. You wanna have collaboration so the teams can still move quickly. Um, and you, it's typically the place where you're going to also do your auditability or your kind of single source of truth. You don't want to build this on a shaky foundation. Um, right now in the market, there are a lot of fragmented tools. There's inconsistent versioning. A lot of organizations we speak to actually have multiple tools for housing different types of artifacts. Models over here, uh, let's say in S3, data in Parquet files, maybe that's in a data lake. You've got your code, of course, in Git, docs, and a wiki. They're all separately versioned, maybe, um, but you often have spreadsheets or just tribal knowledge that knows what goes with what. So what are some of the things that people do use today? Well, you've got S3 or object stores that are nice and scalable, and of course, they're familiar to everybody. But the versioning is pretty poor. The metadata is terrible, if it even exists at all. And they can get expensive really fast, especially if you have large models, large data sets, or things that are changing a lot. This is a good example. Um, this is a set of files. These are data files, but really other than the date, which is the obvious part, there's really not much more I can tell about these files unless I pull them down, unzip them, and actually start interrogating them. That's rough because if I need to go through 20 of these to find what I'm looking for, i.e. maybe there was a piece of PII data added to the database by accident and I need to figure out when was it added, how do I go back, which snapshot you know, was the most recent that didn't have it, for example, could mean pulling down these a lot. Otherwise, Git LFS, we talked about, Git is nice and familiar. We love Git, you love Git, but it storage cost is very high. It's not really tamper-proof um, for the, the artifact itself, just the pointer. DVC is ML specific, but it's also not tamper-proof. It's honestly kind of the same as Git, um, except not even as good because it doesn't use SHA, it uses MD5. Experiment trackers, everybody's got those and they are necessary, they're great. Um, but whether you're using MLflow or Kubeflow, uh, weights and biases, you take your pick, you have some amount of lock-in, you typically have a UI that makes a lot of sense for data science teams, but can be very confusing for DevOps teams. And in the middle of a production incident, that is not when you want to have broken communication at 3 a.m. and DevOps teams trying to go through MLflow, for example, and figure out what was the last good version before the one that just broke in production. Now, one of the things I learned from my time at large organizations like Red Hat and uh, even more so AWS is the secret to security and speed really is reuse. You don't want more components than you need. Um, and the reality is that every enterprise already has a container registry. It's battle tested. It's got RBAC, scanning, signing, global distribution, caching, deduping, compliance, and audit trails are there integration with dev tools and production environments. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of the ideal hub of this wheel. So the question is, can we store ML for artifacts alongside container images in a useful way? So we created KitOps, which 
basically is secure packaging for AIML projects and lives on that OCI artifact standard. You can put models in it of any format, any type, data sets, whether for training, validation, etc. Uh, you can drop your code in there, notebooks, uh, maybe your test scripts for, for ML flow, um, Git repos, pointers to those things if you don't want to put the actual items in there themselves. Uh, configuration prompts, base prompts, system prompts, template prompts, documentation, and metadata. Now, because each asset is stored as a separate layer, you can A, pull only what you need, i.e. give me only the model and the code. I don't need the data set today. Or give me just the configuration and the prompts because I've got a running model. I just want to see how it works. The second thing about being able to put it in layers is, of course, you can take advantage of that container um, uh, optimized storage that, that registries have where they'll look at the layers and see if they change. And if they didn't, they won't actually restore it. So this brings enterprise grade security out of the box. Not only do you get that SHA-256 verification, but you can use cosign, notary, or whatever you like for signing. You've got the existing RBAC, so you don't need to worry about aligning auth Z between your registry, your production system, your DevOps system, et cetera else, which is always a pain. Um, you have immutability and you have a great audit trail. Now, for most people uh, watching this, you probably understand the difference between an OCI image and an OCI artifact, but just in case, let's quickly go over it. So an OCI image is optimized for running something. It is about creating that running environment. You use a Docker file, which is kind of a recipe for that repeatable environment. And it builds everything in sequence from top to bottom. So you can't just run a Docker file from the middle down. It always has to be top to bottom. When you look at KitOps though, it's using the artifact standard, which is different than the OCI image. Now the artifact standard is about storing. And so it still uses layers, for example, but those layers have a different semantic purpose. They're really just there to separate out different types of artifacts. Now, the nice thing is you can store everything you need in one place. You pull only what you need. Now, the nice thing is you can put your models as a layer. Those can be separate from the base model and stay, store only what you need. Data sets can go in. Storing a snapshot of your training and evaluated evaluation data will help you in an audit situation or when you need to do diagnostics for a production environment. So this really ties your data and your model together. And that's important because Unlike microservices, which are loosely coupled, the data and the model um, weights are always very tightly coupled. You can also add code context, and that's really important as well for the same reason. Um, you could have your notebooks in there. You can have your ML uh, flow uh, experiment runs, as I talked about it, dependencies that you need. It keeps that code context tied to a specific version of the model, to a specific version of the data set. And that specific, specificity and interconnectedness is one of the key um, important parts of being able to reproduce an AI ML project. It's a little bit different than reproducing just an AI, uh, a non-AI microservice. This, by the way, when I speak about AI ML projects, I'm talking not just about models, but about agents um, and anything else that you build with AI as part of it. So the KitOps project is really about turning your existing container registry into a secure, secure model registry. And by the way, it can save you money, especially if you're looking at it versus something like an S3 and egress costs there. All right, so let's take a look at a quick live demo. Okay, so now I'm in my terminal. I'm just gonna show you how quick and easy it is to actually package up something as a model kit. So here's my particular directory. You can see I've got my data, my docs, my MLflow artifacts, my MLflow run notebook, uh, my pickle file serialized model, my requirements text, and um, my, my notebook. Everything I need is there. Now, of course, uh, you can store everything as the artifacts themselves in a single KitOps model kit. And if you're in a highly regulated industry, that's the best thing to do because it ensures that you have no references that can get corrupted later. However, if you're not in a regulated industry or you don't need that quite that level of rigor, you can actually just put in references here. And so you could say, well, I've got versioning already happy in Git. I don't need to add my ML flow run, my requirements, or my notebook. I just need to point to the repo that has those things and the commit that is associated with this particular model kit. And that all works fine too. Let's take a look at that kit file because that's really the outline of what's here. Um, I'm just going to scroll back up a little bit. And you can see this looks exactly like what we saw um, earlier. You've got a package description here. 
you've got your model. I've dropped in the parameters from MLflow. Um, so that's gonna be things like what were the best hyperparameters we found? What was the metrics when we use those hyperparameters? And then in case I need to go back to that exact run, I have actually got things like the run ID. Um, skip forward and down, you see I've got my data sets in here and I've got a bunch of docs, a lot of you know licenses and things like that that are also important. So now I'm gonna pack this. So when I pack it, that means I'm gonna take all these different items and put them into create that model kit. And it's gonna use the kit file to know how to find everything and what's there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, it's already saved a bunch of these layers. So as you can see, it only needed to save a couple things differentially, which is great. Now I'm gonna do a kit list. You can see I've got a number of these in my environment already. Uh, I did a bunch of work on this uh, about a week and a half ago. So you can see those older versions here. And here's the one from today. Excellent, so it saved it all perfectly locally. Now let's push that from my local version to my, um, my uh, repository. In this case, I'm gonna use the Jozu repository, but you can push it to any repository you want. All right, and that's it. Okay, so now here we are in the Jozu hub. Um, as you can see, I've saved this model kit here. Uh, you can see this is the one I just created. If I wanted to share it, of course, I can just pull the tag that's gonna copy this command. I can send that to anybody over Slack or whatever have you, and they're gonna get the exact same model kit. I get a quick at a glance view of what's inside this model kit up here, or I can look in more detail down here. And you can see that a lot of this is the same information I had from the kit file, but now expanded because I have also the information from the manifest. So now I have the SHA, I have the size, I have a number of other things. It's formatted in a much easier way. These little pulls also make it easy for me to copy the kit uh, command so I can pull just a section of this model kit rather than the whole thing. Uh, I can also do a quick diff. If I was, let's say, looking at um, an older version, I might come back and look at the March 5th version and see what changed there. I've added a lot to the code section, as you can see. I added some uh, license information to the data set, um, but the data set itself didn't change. And you can see I've added up a number of things to the documentation as well. So, you know, the, the data set and model in this case haven't changed, uh, but some of the metadata has. And so that may or may not justify a redeploy. Of course, the other thing I want to do is deploy this. So at some point, I want to deploy this either um, probably to Kubernetes. So in this case, um, this is not a, uh, an LLM. So I'm just going to use a basic container. Um, this is going to give my team everything that they need for the specifics of this model. Now, this obviously isn't the full deployment YAML. There's a lot of deployment YAML uh, I'd want around it uh, that was specific to my organization, specific to the project, specific to the environment, all those kinds of things. We're not trying to replace that. We know that in general, the DevOps team has a good handle on that part. We're just trying to provide the little chunk that is needed to them that they may not know, that they may not be able to find as easily. And so we auto-generate that for them. The other possibility is, of course, you might just want to deploy it to Docker and run it either locally or on a shared instance. In this case, you just execute this command and it'll actually pull it down as an image. We automatically convert the model portion of the model kit to an OCI image, and then that can be run inside Docker. So that's how I get quickly from having a bunch of artifacts on my local machine to having a model kit that I can share that's stored in my enterprise registry in a secure fashion, potentially security scanned, and even deployed to my Kubernetes environment all quite simply. Now the question is, can I do that automatically without having to use the CLI? Because not everybody likes to use a CLI. And the good news is that yes, we have something called PyKitOps, which is our library for Python that allows you to do all these things through code. Super helpful if you want to build your model kit directly out of an experiment tracker like Kubeflow or MLflow or directly from a notebook. So you can see that I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but basically you just import in the KitOps packages, define your credentials, initialize the manager, log in to your registry, initialize it using your, um, your kit file, and then pack and push the same thing I just did in the CLI. If you want to learn more about KitOps, there is a tutorial there. You can, uh, you can use your phone to jump into that. Or if you want to learn more about Jozu, you can do that as well. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope this was helpful.